Hi. Hi, everybody. Good to see all of you. I'm Cameron Kelly. I'm one of the lecturers here at CSUC Art and Art History Department. And, um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to Coulter Jacobson's talk tonight. Um, Coulter, I, I understand, was you've been here before. Yes. You sat, he sat in on some classes with Sherry Simons years ago because his sister attended uh, Chico State. So yeah. you've been here before. Yeah, Chico <laughs> Pride. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, so I want to thank, uh, before I introduce uh, Coulter, I want to thank um, this year's uh, committee of grads. That's Adria Davis, uh, Melinda Blank, uh, and Callan King um, for their time and energy in selecting Coulter and uh, making our posters and tending to our guest. So thank you. Um, Coulter had a couple of studio visits today with a few grads and uh, will continue his uh, studio visits uh, tomorrow. Um, and we must thank Sherry Simons for putting, for heading the committee and putting this all together. <laughs> thank you for making this happen. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, so Coulter is our second um, Hopper visiting artist uh, this year. Um, this series is generously funded by um, Sherry and David Hopper um, in an effort to engage active working artists with our MFA graduate candidates and um, to bring fresh perspectives to our, our entire creative community. Um, this is a vital exchange and it connects students with uh, practicing artists um, who've been through school and are now using their skills to relate to the world and maybe even to understand themselves <laughs> a little more. Um, the, the more artists we bring back into this learning process, um, the richer um, we are for it. So we thank David and Sherry for helping us do this. Thank you. So uh, Coulter received his uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts from the San Francisco um, Art Institute in 2001. And in 2010, uh, he was awarded the Sika Prize which includes uh, purchasing a, a good size of the artist's uh, work and an exhibition at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, so it's a huge honor. Um, and um, a recent solo exhibition was presented at uh, Paula Anglin Gallery last year. And um, also some notable exhibitions include uh, The Air We Breathe at the SF MoMA, um, Urban Stories, the at the Contemporary Center in Vilnius, where's mm -hmm. that? Lithuania. <laughs> Lithuania. <laughs> and um, four exhibitions at uh, White Collins in New York. So please welcome Coulter Jacobson. Well, thanks so much, Sherry and all those involved for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. At Chico has a place in my heart as she said my sister was here and so were my uh, close friends from high school so I'd come up here on road trips um, am I talking loud enough louder yeah, okay oh um, I'm gonna be reading uh, probably for the first half I've been writing a lot lately so I thought I'd kind of represent my my present to you uh, and maybe work backwards or sort of backwards anti-chronological anyway it's like chronological comes from Kronos who was the father of time who ate his children so I'm <laughs> kind of gonna regurgitate them like he did too so um, the title of the lecture is one always fails to speak of the things one loves volume really okay uh, it could also be called lecture for small, like Chico, but... <laughs> uh, what, what is an artist lecture? More than once I've heard friends say that they were disappointed by an artist lecture, that they even liked the artist's work less after hearing them talk about it. Is this the reason it terrifies me, or is it just the formality of it? So what is an artist lecture? Is it an extended artist statement? 
I try to avoid artist statements as much as possible, or what I mean is that I avoid a certain kind of artist statement. The type of artist statement where I explain what I'm trying to do with a piece of art or what a work of art m of mine means. Yet I stand here stating something. I like to assume that my, my work is better when someone learns about it without my presence, almost as if my presence dampens the artwork. If I do approach the artist statement, I tend to use it more as a platform for something that might relate to my work peripherally, or something I'd like to pair with my work, a quote, a poem, etc., to see how or if the sparks fly when it comes in contact with the work, or to pair my work with a source that helped prompt the work. Some people might consider this absence of explanation or more poetic approach disconcerting, confusing, baffling. I feel that it is a great way to enter art, work, and poetry. Mess with the conventions. Put the mess back in message. Making sense is just one approach among many, and it's not generally in my character to make sense. Actually, making sense and being clear is very difficult for me. One of my very favorite artist statements, which wasn't necessarily said as an artist statement, but taken as one by myself, is by uh, an artist, Lance, Lance River. I should probably go forward. I actually just put these slides up. They're uh, images of uh, stains I've been coming across while walking ab about mostly San Francisco. And I was kind of just curious how they'd look in fast succession. And maybe they don't work as animation. But their, their meaning might kind of, uh... oh, I'm going through my whole lecture now. <laughs> I don't, oh, I see what it does. Go back. Yeah, I was just telling somebody that a PowerPoint is so, like, against everything I believe in. <laughs> and it seems like it should be kind of like something CEOs use, but, and why do artists use it? But, uh, here I am. I'm, I'm demonstrating why artists shouldn't use it. <laughs> and so I'm hoping this is back. Yes, okay. So, it's anti chronological. <laughs> okay, so this piece is by Lance Rivers. He's an artist who makes landscape drawings and paintings at a very cool space in SF called Creativity Explored, a day program for artists with developmental disabilities. I ask him, why do you draw bridges? And he answers, I like bridges. This feels to me to be one of the most pure statements. And why should there be any elaboration? His liking bridges is like the light shining from a star. It just shines. Um, like the word consider, which I just learned uh, means light coming from the stars. Consider that. <laughs> uh, the bridge is a place between two places. And I think, so this is, I think that might be the bridge I crossed today, Carquinas. And it's also Lance Rivers' piece. Uh, it's reminiscent of Pascal's riddle, a place without a place that may touch many places, which is a ship. I am reminded of the first line of a poem titled uh, L.A. Odyssey by my friend Cedar Saigo, which uh, begins, I, am, I almost insist on the words as doors swinging from the force no one saw. And the way I read that, when I first read it, was uh, I almost insist on the images as doors swinging from the force no one saw. And uh, another poem, The alien light of the honeycomb, a lit from its premises. This is a quote from my friend Jason Morris's book of poems called From the Golden West Notebooks. It was the last line in a chat book called American Outpost, and it woke me up like I had never been awakened. I read the entire book and didn't understand much of it until the very last line. I then reread it in one sitting and felt very much connected to it, sitting there on Rodeo Beach. And I'll read the line again. The alien light of the honeycomb, a lit from its premises. I had just started keeping bees and I held a honeycomb up to the 
for the light to kind of ref for the sun to go over my shoulder to look into the, the honeycomb and there is this alien light and he just kind of nailed it. But, um, but this, this last line also led me to consider the nature of endings. Later I learned from Jason that the chapbook was only a part of a large work. In the introduction to her sonnets, Bernadette Mayer asks, is poetry's method of conclusion disjoined to, for instance, the life of a bee? I paired these two quotes together for an application for the Sika Award for SF MoMA where it asked for my statement. Since so much of my work is related peripherally, it makes sense to demonstrate this in the same way, not to be direct, but to enter the work from the side with play and an open field. I thought too that since I often draw from all kinds of different source material for my work and that, that I should read from poets that I admire. The first is the introduction to Mary Rufel's book of essays titled Madness, Rack and Honey which derived from invitations to present lectures. <laughs> you probably didn't know you are going to hear all this poetry. but. Uh, Okay, so I'm quoting her. She says, I never set out to write this book. In 1994, I began to be required to deliver standing lectures to graduate students, and the requirement terrified me. I was told the students preferred informal, spontaneous talks, but I am a rotten and unsteady extemporizer. I preferred to write my lectures because I am a writer, and writing is my natural act, more natural than speaking. I always look to scance at writing on writing, but I'm intelligent enough to see that writing is writing. Still, my allegiance to poetry, to art, is greater than my allegiance to knowledge and intelligence, and that stance is harder and harder to maintain in today's world because knowledge and intelligence form the corporate umbrella, the academy, that shelters and protects poetry in a culture that cares about other things. And I was thinking about art, which is what I do when I read poetry, uh, how, you know, what is, what is that corporate umbrella for us? It's like basically like all these art fairs and the art world, and magazines and all this stuff. It's kind of a different thing than poetry. Poetry seems to be a little more uh, light. But in the audio lectures from Harvard's The Listening Booth, John Ashbery says, Unfortunately, I feel incapable of explaining my work. I once attempted to do this in a question and answer period with some students of my friend Richard Howard after which he told me they wanted the key to your poetry but you presented them with a new set of locks. That sums up for me my feeling on the subject of unlocking my poetry. I am unable to do so because I feel that my poetry is the explanation. The explanation of what? Of my thought, whatever that is. As I see it, my thought is both poetry and the attempt to explain that poetry. The two cannot be disentangled. I know this isn't going to satisfy anybody and will probably be taken as another form of arrogance from an off-putting poet. On occasions, when I have tried to discuss the meanings of my poems, I have found that I was inventing implausible sounding ones, which I knew to be untrue. That does seem to be something like arrogance. In any case, as a poet who cares very much about having an audience, I'm sorry about the confusion I have involuntarily helped to cause. In the words of William Emson, if I could tell you, I would let you know. I'm also mildly distressed that not being able to give a satisfactory account of my work, because in certain moods this inability seems like a limit to my power of invention. After all, if I can invent poetry, why can't I invent the meaning? I, I'm going to stop quoting that, but I, I wrote down a lot more of it. And another, later on in the lecture, uh, he quotes a more extreme example uh, by John Barthes, who says, You shouldn't pay very much attention to anything writers say. They don't know why they do what they do. They're like good tennis players or good painters who are just full of nonsense, pompous and embarrassing, or merely mistaken when they open their mouths. That's a quote. I don't know if I totally <laughs> buy into that, but okay. Um, I'm going to quote one more uh, person. This one's an artist, Richard Tuttle. Um, it was in an interview I listened to recently on Penn Sounds. Um, 
he's addressed, um, you were saying, knowing that I'd be asking you to talk and to read, that you felt very much you were without words, that you had no words, yet you were saying that in words, and I wondered what could you possibly mean? And his answer was, well, it's, as you know, being married to a poet who is maybe exemplary for people who have words, and everyone would have to agree that having words or verbal skills are either lesser or greater or can be developed and it's a relative state. Perhaps the shocking thing that I discovered was that my words were not poor, they actually are absent. As if when all good things were handed out when it came to the verbal, you got nothing or zero from that. I must say, it's a shocking thing to discover that about oneself, although I suspect there are a lot of people who really do not have words, and I'm really speaking for them because you suffer a lot, as words are important as they are, and the kinds of communication are so important. For example, with my dog. <laughs> I kind of didn't really understand what he meant by that, but uh, I, I, I liked it, that it was there. I recently finished reading a book whose author never intended to have it published. It's called The Preparation of the Novel by Roland Barthes, which primarily consists of the last lectures given before Barthes was suddenly struck by a laundry van while walking home. He died a month later due to, due to injuries suffered from the accident. I cannot help but to read into this biographical detail and let it shine some light on the lectures as I read them. We tend to emphasize the final works and moments of a life as if there were some secret code to be cracked that might reveal something of the mystery that is life and death, very much like we are also interested in source and origin or the first gestations of an artwork. The lectures from the preparation of the novel are not so much a how-to book, rather they are looking very closely at the behaviors of those that write novels trying to identify different stages of the process, quoting a variety of authors and their approach to the task of writing a novel and what leads up to it. And of course, by extension, the book can be read as a handbook for any act of creation despite discipline, be it writing, art making, or music, etc., even for the preparation of this lecture for Chico. The writer's desk, its organizing principles and arrangements likened unto the artist's studio, the arrangement of tools and systems of access to these tools. Aren't these the beginnings of the creative process, these habits and preparations, these accumulations of tools making space for the mind and for the hands to invite in the ideas, the muse? It's written in beautiful open-ended fragments like notes for a lecture, somewhat casual and never so conclusive. Besides bringing in intimate personal anecdotes that Bartz is known for, such as grieving for his recently deceased mother, it discusses haiku as a notation or fragment of the now, a very short form that implies a whole unlike the multiplicity of the novel form and the urge to string fragments together for the, the appearance of flow and narrative, such as Proust's remembrance of things past. He has countless references to a variety of diaries essays and texts demonstrating many approaches. About ten years ago, before I even knew he had been delivering lectures on the preparation of the novel, I read somewhere a rumor that Bartz had been just setting out on beginning a new novel of his own before his untimely death. And so finally, to put the rumor to rest somewhat, we find out that Bartz had only gotten eight pages into his novel. Although reproduced for the first time in the preparation of the, of the novel, of the eight pages, each single page is actually a slightly revised outline for a novel to be titled La Vita Nuova, The New Life After Dante's, an autobiographical account of Dante's love and infatuation with his muse, Beatrice, written in both poems along or accompanied by poems or prose that explain each poem. So why would Bartz name his working novel Vita Nuova? I have often thought about a quote from the artist as critic, an essay from Every Force Evolves a Form by Guy Davenport. And this is the quote. When he claims to be, oh, first, sorry, he's, he's quoting uh, Claude Levi-Strauss from uh, the, Way, the Way of the Masks, and then he'll go into his own uh, part. But 
The artist lulls himself in a perhaps fruitful illusion, but the privilege he grants himself is not real. When he thinks he is expressing himself spontaneously, creating an original work, he is answering other past or present, actual or potential creators. Whether one knows it or not, one never walks along the path, one never walks alone along the path of creativity. And then here's the Guy Davenport part. What's happening here is a process I like to call finishing, not in the sense of culminating, but of polishing. Art as a continuity is, give, is given to refining, to remaking the greater economy and finer effect. The genetic components of a work of art are responses, both of agreement and modification. Spontaneous generation is as uncommon in art as in nature. The arts are a way of internalizing experience, allowing us to look with wonder at a past that isn't ours. But enough of ours so that all stories are, as Joyce says, the same anew. It is not, therefore, surprising that the best books are old books rewritten. The tribe has its tales, so there we are. Where else could we be? I can't help but to feel that Bart's avoidance of ever writing the novel, and instead writing about writing a novel, and writing a novel named after Dante's novel, was exactly the point and also where an active invitation is extended to each of us to write our own fiction, our own finishing and polishing. As if its very absence, its just beginning, its deliberations and seeming to get stuck in looking instead of, in, in looking instead at what a novel is and what a novel can be and what will the novel of the, fu of the future be then becomes the new novel. Did he succeed in writing it? I liken the, pra the practice of drawing to a kind of unfinished state. Only very recently has drawing been considered a practice unto itself with a history of always being a lead up or a preparation to painting a, a lesser form. Bart's enthusiasm for the creative process is so exuberant that he gets stuck at looking at it and creates something from that position of beginning. And I equate my practice to a similar sort of blindness or delay or avoidance of things. Perhaps it's even more an approach to seeing things peripherally or seeing them by not looking directly at them. A witness said that they saw Bart's look both ways before crossing the street. So how could Bart's not have seen the approaching laundry van? One simple answer might be that he merely went through the motions of what a pedestrian is supposed to do, an empty gesture, like someone on their headset, waving elaborate hand gestures to emphasize their point when there is no one to witness such, such gestures. It's similar to driving while speaking on your cell phone. But obviously he was weighing something in his mind. He was preoccupied with the thought. His walking was secondary. He was thinking without seeing. I am interested in the nature of that changing picture in the mind. Uh, my way of reading preparation of the, of the novel is also elliptical. I've been reading it as a guide for a preparation for a walk. I was asked to do a show in San Diego, which is my hometown, uh, or was my hometown. I live in San Francisco now. It's for the end of this year, so I proposed walking from my home here to my old home. Stopping at a rest stop along El Camino Real and reading a marker about the length of the Camino Real being approximately the distance from where I was born to where I now live in the Bay Area sparked the idea for the walk. One practical reason for proposing the walk is because for the last year I've had uh, problems with my hands. A couple years ago, I stepped away from my art practice, or at least slowed it down very much, so as to learn about practice itself. I joined in several building projects, building a Japanese joinery structure that met once a week with a group of students with not much training in woodwork. We were like Zen student, beginner mind kind of students. I also participated in building a stone wall with a mason that had learned his train, trade in Cornwall, England. I have never been a builder of any kind, so this was a first for me. I love the work very much, however exhausting. I had the best deserving sleep with dreams of fitting stones together. But what this led to, besides severe carpal tunnel, 
was an intense meditation on the importance of tools and how you use them and your body's relation to them. Indeed, it was my body that finally told me I needed to step back and look at the way I made art, look at how I used my body to make work. And uh, I think one last quote from Bart's lecture. Uh, it kind of helps to illustrate how I feel presently. So it's session, uh, December 9, 1978. A lecture isn't a performance, and as far as possible, you shouldn't come here expecting a show that will either enchant or disappoint, or even because such perversity exists that will enchant because it disappoints. <laughs> there's, a, there's a design to this course that I'm trying to keep to and an outline that I'm trying to fill in week after week and perhaps year after year. In the first two sessions I want to acknowledge the personal and even phantasmatic origins of this course. And I was thinking uh, when he said phantasma uh, phantasmatic of the fantasy and the daydreaming while he got hit. But, um, Last time I explained that at a certain point in a life, which I gave the mythical name the middle of the journey as a result of certain circumstances, certain devastations, and for him I think that was the death of his mother, um, and for me I was thinking, my hands. <laughs> uh, he says, the desire to write can present itself as the obvious recourse, the practice whose phantasmatic force would enable a new beginning, a vita nuova. And I think I'll, I think I'll just end with um, uh, the reading part, anyway, of uh, the last manuscript uh, on which Barthes worked was an essay on Stendhal. Uh, it was left on his desk on the day of the accident, and it had been titled "One Always Fails to Speak of the Things One Loves," which is where I got the title. And that was a Google search of uh, the location of where he got hit. Where are your systems of planets around us? That's uh, Susan Howe line. And um, it's one of those lines that I was struck by. It was a piece that she wrote about her husband who had passed away. I was thinking a lot about that quote when I made these pieces. And also uh, about my hands too, and not being able to draw. And uh, so this was a show I did in England. Um, the show is called Ellipses, dot, dot, dot. And uh, this was done with a magnifying glass and the sun as my collaborator. And I would find these old pieces of paper around in thrift stores or in people's windows or wherever where the sun had already kind of cooked a shape into the paper. And um, thus the square on the left. And then I burned um, stars with the sun and made a negative, a uh, digital negative to show with it. And this series was called Peace, an Accidental Breathing Space. And so again, um, I found this on the street. It must have been somebody's poster with maybe family photo photographs. And so I burned within each, you can see, rectangle. And, and this one, I actually, those two previous were kind of made up stars. And this one was uh, copying the coma um, cluster. It's like the most densely uh, uh, it has the most galaxies, the most dense amount of galaxies. <coughs> and this was a record album. I use record albums a lot. Uh, you know, since they're not used very much, they're, they're all, there's always a lot of uh, material, uh, record, record materials laying around. But this one's called uh, Live the Mass, which is a great title, uh, but it was, it was there. 
And this piece, um, yeah, this was also in the show, and this was a drawing, and it's kind of more what I, I do and I'm known for, I guess, but uh, it went really slow because of my hand, and I was trying to develop different ways to draw, so it went uh, very slow, but um, I think I had something to read for this one. Well, I can't find it. This was a, a um, piece of paper that I pulled out of the New Yorker uh, when I was living in Baltimore, like probably 15 years ago. And uh, the poem, I was struck by the poem, it's called The Mad Scene by James Merrill. Um, and it really, it struck a chord with me and I folded it up and put it in my pocket for all those, the last 15 years and it kind of slowly became worn at the edges um, where it was folded and became these kind of, like almost a tablet or some my own personal Bible, I guess. But uh, he kind of opened my eyes, this poet. Um, yeah, and, and well, he, he was a strange guy. He used the Ouija board uh, with his lover, his boyfriend, to create poems. And just reading that, this was kind of a feature on him because he had just died and I had never heard of him. And it just, uh, I was kind of closeted then, so reading something like that, it meant even more to me. It was very uh, eye-opening, reading about their relationship. And, uh, yeah. And it's also, the first line is, again, last night I dreamed the dream called laundry. <laughs> and uh, you'll see how maybe that kind of connects peripherally to uh, some of the later work after this. <coughs> this was another drawing from the same show. Um, and did I write anything? Um, for this drawing, I tried to have no source material, which is uh, rare for me. Usually, I am always copying and drawing from something, duplicating. But this one, I wanted it to be really doodly, and uh, just like covering your dust jackets in, you know, junior high school. You know, you draw like Metallica symbol or something. Um, I was, that's kind of what I was thinking and it was again because of my hand and um, it had to be slow and I was experimenting and, um, and this was actually during um, uh, like Occupy in New York and I was kind of thinking about that too. I had just read um, um, Rip Van Winkle and I hadn't realized that in that story where uh, Rip Van Winkle falls asleep for 20 years that it was during the American Revolution. So I was kind of thinking about this idea of an American spring and that Rip Van Winkle just kind of slept right through it. And um, that was kind of my inspiration for this piece. I was also thinking about a piece uh, that I live with. It's by this guy, Christopher Garrett. And it's a terrible reproduction, but I just took a picture, so you can reference it. But it's, um, you can see what it is. I love this piece, and I've lived with it for a long time. And I, I've always felt you could just kind of set your head into it. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm in a band, too, and I actually made a song kind of about this, but it's, uh, yeah, what are the words? It's, uh, your smile is a hammock, I'll take a nap in, palm trees on fire leaning in on me. So I was kind of thinking about the hammock, the palm trees on fire leaning in on me, two Rip Van Winkles share the same beard, sleeping for a hundred years. Uh, the half dome was once a whole dome worn glacially. Those are the lyrics. And here, speaking of a glacier, here's a glacier. Uh, this is a a watercolor painting of a uh, found letter. I just found it on the street, so it's sort of like a torn envelope. 
and uh, with a card um, of a painting of Yosemite. And so, I, you know, I, in my art shows, I try to think of how things are, are grouped together. And I was sort of thinking, this is sort of rips. This is the West Coast rip <laughs> instead of upstate New York. Um, and this was actually a letter um, from uh, a mother to her daughter. And I kind of like the... I wrote the text down somewhere. Somehow I... Oh, here we go. It says, Dear Stephanie, just wanted you to know how much I appreciate you coming down to Aunt Lucy's for my birthday. I love the puzzle and cute pink top. But most of all, I love spending time with you. By the time you get this, I will be home from our trip. Can't wait. Love you, Mom. And I'm not really sure if the person ever received it, although I assume they did because it's torn. But a car tire could have done that too, I suppose. Um, I was also thinking, I recently read this book called California by Kevin Starr, kind of to research this walking trip. And he uses the phrase uh, in regards to um, Californians' mentality for the last maybe 100 years or, or more of uh, reverent awe and exploitive use. And I, I've just been thinking about that a lot, also in, in terms of memory and forgetting. So it seems like, to me, like remembering is the reverent awe and forgetting is the exploitive use, but that might just be in my head, I don't know. But <laughs> so this was also part of the show, and also different for me because they're, I don't know, collages and not drawings. Um, but in my mind, it also kind of connected because of the poem, the mad scene about the laundry. Um, again, last night I dreamed a dream called Laundry. And uh, this is made from record album sleeves. So there's sort of a play on the idea of sleeves. Um, and I made a lot of them. There was also a Kurt Schwitter show um, in England that seemed to kind of I, I didn't even know it was up, but I'd, I'd made it, the, the show was in Berkeley, and I saw it and made collages from the um, exhibition catalog, or just the, the little thing they hand out. And, uh, and there happened to be a show while I was having my show, so I turned, I turned two of his pieces into a, a shirt. This is from a letter, like a, like a bill. I, I, I just did one of these at first and I got really into them and mostly it was about these patterns like so much of my work is representational and I almost feel like this was my first kind of window and headed towards abstraction uh, which I really admire. I love abstract art. It's kind of like the thing I'm, I'm in awe of <laughs> uh, but, it's, but I don't do it. Uh, so that was just a install shot. And oh, so the background, that blue in the back was all um, this newspaper in England. They have the sun and the star. And so the gallery was collecting it for me uh, by my request. And when I got there, I painted sort of like a midnight blue over most of it. I would leave little tiny things that you could kind of see. And, and then I also just made two books that were covered and then sort of flecked stars uh, all over them. So it's just a big book of stars, two books of stars. So this was the first shirt that I did. <coughs> See how I'm going backwards? Yeah. Uh, so, and the, it, this, this is a good demonstration of like why I did it. Basically, um, the shirt on the right it's a gift card. It was a card that uh, my boyfriend gave me. And it's a print by George Schneeman, who's a painter, collagist from New York. And he, um, so he gave me the card, but inside of it was this reproduction, black and white reproduction of my friend's uh, artwork, this guy Ajit Chauhan. And 
it was a present to me, like saying, you're going to get this after his show is down, this piece. He did this great show where everything was um, for trade only. And so uh, we traded for this. And uh, since it was a black and white reproduction, I cut it up and turned it into that. Um, and made it as close as I could to George Schneeman. So that was the first shirt. Although I immediately responded to it because I made this shirt when I was like, uh, I don't know, 20 or something. And in a printmaking class at a community college down in San Diego. And uh, this was my grandfather's uh, work shirt. And uh, he had just died, so it meant a lot to me, you know. But I, th I think that's kind of why I was probably initially drawn to the shirts. And so there's a lot of shirts. <laughs> More envelopes. They kind of became portraits, like helmets or something. Faces. And this was another show, Paula Anglum's. I don't know why I included it. So this was a, a show uh, in New York. It was a, um, in Greenpoint. And it was a one night show, sort of like a residency. Just this, I had this small space where I could do anything I want. I had three weeks to kind of be in the space. And I had been working on this piece uh, that, was a, that was a commission uh, from this New York collector, oddly. He just kind of handed me a check that had never happened to me before. It's very strange. <laughs> And he was an expert on the Goldberg Variations by Bach. And um, I like Bach. Uh, and so I was, I thought maybe I could, he, he kind of gave me the option to make whatever you want. He just sort of said, he pointed to another work that was up on display at SF Moments that I want it to be that, that big, <laughs> for that much work. So I said, okay, check. And I, I wanted to make it about the Goldberg variations because he was working on them and trying to play them. And also, it was sort of my meditation still about uh, hands and how to approach them, how not, or, or how to reuse them, I guess. Um, so this piece, these are terrible slides, sorry, but um, this was a found fabric that was already kind of stre on these stretcher bars and I added this book, pay this uh, the cover of a book and these are, so I mean they look like vases but to me they were sleeves and they, the sleeves come from this conductor in Ernst Block, you'll see a, a, an image later that uh, is a copy of this photograph of his, his arms conducting. And this was an exquisite corpse that I did with a friend, uh, and it's real. Like, that really happened. <laughs> you could see, like, halfway through is where the fold was, and uh, we were just happened to be kind of in the same hand space, I guess. And there's a quote by uh, Little Wings, uh, Kyle Field, Kyle Field's band, I think it's, if, uh, what is it, if music, if, I can't remember, if something's the wrist, music, if words are the wrist, music's the perfume, that's it. it comes from a great song. And uh, these were the keys to the gallery. And uh, there, the, there was one actually painted green. There was kind of this whole green theme coming up, I think because of Greenpoint, but also something to do with um, box music that I still can't really explain. <laughs> but I was thinking too that the keys, like there's 88 keys in the piano. And this is a. It's a kind of a copy of a Paul uh, Noget, who was a Belgian photographer, sort of surrealist um, poet too, I think. And he has a piece called uh, A New Way of Juggling. 
and it's so it's this figure who's laying down on a table with maybe four balls laying on the table and I just didn't draw the balls and changed the title to a new way of struggling and someone named Rose must have owned this book cover at one time and these are both found at like thrift stores um, Uh, I actually found out the artist of that that one on the right. He lives in New York now, and the one on the left. I don't. It's so mysterious to me, but it's perfect. I think it says Bach at the top, and then black where the curtains are, and then bed. And the Goldberg variations were also a commission uh, by this count of Russia who um, had like apparently like a young pianist who would play him music when he couldn't sleep at night and so this count commissioned to make the the Goldberg variations and um, so in a way that was too weird the connections because there's a bed it's Bach it's amazing <laughs> and it's also got the symmetry the stain where it was folded and there's a lot of symmetry and um, in almost like palindromic uh, phrases in Bach's compositions. And these are more record sleeves, more green for green point. This was an album cover um, copied from Art Tatum, the blind musician who liked Bach and um, Bach also went blind towards the end of his life. And I just changed the word to mute, mutate, art, best of art, mutate, more found exercises. And the Goldberg va variations, uh, they weren't named that by Bach, but they were actually, um, he called them keyboard exercises. And so I thought this also kind of demonstrated, um, the, you know, practicing drawing. And there's these great remarks like, not right. You're drawing from memory or something like that, pointing at the knuckles. It's really funny. I think they're great hands. <laughs> I love them. And this was just a found signature in a book that also was in the show. Um, this person named Lewis Rist, which I'm sure doesn't really exist. but. <laughs> and so I had this like sign outside the, win outside the gallery. You can like And then I had a poem that I, I copied out of a book, and it's by Ted Berrigan. And somehow, like, this poem just kind of was the glue for the whole show to me. And uh, I don't know if you want to read part of it or not, but it, it, uh, it's from his sonnets. And his sonnets, there's, originally it was, the intention was that there were going to be 88 of them, but I think there's only 68 or something. And, uh, I was sort of, I was thinking that he al always wanted 88 there, and there's 88 you know keys to the piano there's 88 sections of the sky for the constellations and um, so I thought that was kind of uh, a weird coincidence and a lot of his words kind of repeat later on he'll take sections of one sonnet and bring it back later and it's almost like a book of collages it's really a the most creative book I've ever read. And this is my boyfriend at the keyboard doing his keyboard exercises. <laughs> and uh, that this was the conductor's sleeves and they actually went right next to each other. Like, I, I didn't document this show very well. And then I did these anagrams of the word Goldberg variations. So I did 30 of them because there's 30 variations in the composition and uh, and and then there's an aria at the beginning and an aria at the end but that was fun <laughs> and now I think maybe I should just end it it's it's almost seven already
Or should I just keep going? I could just kind of go through the images if you want. Or if you want to ask questions, I don't know. Up to you. It's supposed to be an hour, right? <laughs> More? Okay, this also I don't have a great uh, re uh, image of, but this was a piece uh, sent to Freeze Art Fair, so it, it's weird. It's like when they go to Freeze, it's like it, it didn't even happen or something. Um, though I did get paid, so that's nice. Uh, the, the image on the left is... Um, well, the whole thing, I almost think of it as a film. And it's like a film portrait of this guy named Douglas Tilden, who was a sculptor, a deaf sculptor. And he um, was apparently huge probably like uh, 80 years ago. Everyone probably knew his name and now nobody does. But there's a sculpture in Berkeley campus, that one in the second from the left. It's um, two uh, football players, one's mending the other. So he made that sculpture. And I always walk by it and just think it's kind of beautiful. And, um, so this same uh, sculptor, he kind of died in misery and he was poor and bitter and it's a sad story. But he also uh, worked in doing casts for the movie The Lost World, which is this old black and white film kind of about uh, inventing a time machine and going back to the dinosaur age. Uh, so the one on the right, that's a still with the, uh, uh, the words um, from the film. And, oops, so this piece, where is it? On the left, there's a popular song called Lost in the World by um, Kanye West and Bon Iver. And I think I might have found it just from Google searching Lost World, but I found this great YouTube of a guy um, doing an ASL version of the song. So he was sort of dancing and signing the whole song. And I drew stills of the two uh, scenes, one where he's doing the word lost and where he's doing the word world. And that's from that side. In the background, too, there's this Andy Warhol reproduction of two Elvises. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's more to that piece. These are um, tinfoil from the street. Mostly cigarette, I think, and, and gum. And this is a drawing um, from uh, grinder.com. It's like for gays who want to hook up. <laughs> and if I s saw a friend, he had it on his iPhone. And I thought it was very strange. And so I took a picture and did a drawing of it. But it's kind of that concept of the French call it mise en abime, which is this... Uh, sort of window within a window of itself into eternity, kind of. Um, and this was from a series of, um, it was called Faceless Book. And it was guys trying to um, hook up to on Craigslist. And so I just took, uh, I just did paintings of the ones that had uh, masked out their faces, mm -hmm. called it Faceless Book. And that's a watercolor, and it's actually like this big. But this this was a show, it was all kind of about um, thinking about the word searching, or searching just in different ways, searching online, searching uh, for love, searching for lust. Um, this is a piece, it's a postcard from a show by this artist, Bastian Otter, uh, who was a conceptualist from the 70s and uh, apparently died in his last piece which was called In Search of the Miraculous and this was I think one part of that series it's just called Searchin' and it's just the words from this coaster song uh, called Searchin' where and he just kind of walks through LA and eventually ends up at the coast uh, there's probably a coaster coast pun but it's a great song and uh, we played it I remember my band played it kind of in a, see, we, we made it like a minor version of it. It's, it's in a major chord, but we turned it minor. So you can listen to it as you look at the, it's a great song. Yeah. 
And then this is my boyfriend. I've never really seen Bastian Otter's art. I've only seen it through reproductions and um, except that postcard. And uh, so my boyfriend was at a show in Los Angeles and he took a picture of one of the pieces from that series. So you can kind of see his reflection. And this piece is called Suddenly the Screens we're turning on their people. And it's, um, that's a, I think it's an advertisement for Comcast. I saw it on buses a long time ago, but like, that's really weird. This is also a reflection of my boyfriend. You can barely see him, but it's in a Wallace Berman painting of uh, married couples. It's called Art is Love is God. Oh no, the piece is called, uh, Untitled Faceless Faces. I think he was onto something. He has these other pieces, hands holding radios, and he put these images inside the radios. It's like iPhones, but in the 60s. <laughs> he should get royalties or something. And this was a piece uh, for the Air We Breathe at SF MoMA. That was the uh, kind of artist addressing uh, gay marriage. And I was just, I kind of wanted to document what it would be like just to have a, a witnessless marriage. And you, can, you can't really even see it, but it says witnesslessness at the bottom. And the N-E-N-E -N -E hits our knees conveniently. Whoa, that was... <laughs> but it's supposed to sort of be like a mask too. Like that, but like we're kind of under arrest too in a way. And then these were these uh, kind of, this was from a long time ago. Um, they were one hour time drawings of men wearing watches. And they came mostly from like old school ads for guys that were trying to hook up back when snail mail was the only way. So there's a few of these. It's another one. These are actually one stroke apart literally on the clock, <laughs> which makes me think I should stop at 7.03. <laughs> yeah, I'll stop. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This was uh, from a postcard, so the drawing is again that big. That's such a weird, that's why this format is so weird, but um, this was a postcard that I, uh, a friend gave me, and then it turned out that it was uh, the river that my boyfriend would swim in when he was a kid in New Milford, Connecticut. So that made me interested in it. <laughs> and I uh, started drawing it, and I did a memory, I do these things called memory drawings. Or I haven't for a while, but um, where I draw as closely as I can from the photograph, and then I draw it a second time from memory, putting the other one away, and then I'll. But for this one, usually I do two, and the pieces are usually about sort of twoness and pairs. And but this one, I was invited to do, to do this show that lasted for a year, and uh, it was a group show. The premise was a group show, it was called Passengers, and at one, one month of the year you'd get a solo show in the middle. But I took advantage of, of the year by doing one memory drawing a month. And so uh, you can kind of see, there's, it, I, I wish I had a better image, but that image is right here. And for this particular season, uh, series, I had been doing them so long these memory drawings sort of challenge me a little more. I would flip them, do the mirror image, and so like the memory would kind of get more convoluted and confused. And and uh, and I also was thinking compositionally. I was hoping it would kind of look like a river was sort of snaking around. 
and so uh, yeah, it, you don't you don't see the detail very much, but I can show you like other memory drawings. Like that's a memory drawing. The that's a, sorry, that's a memory drawing. So I just draw from the photograph, and then that's the memory over there. And uh, this is the month of February. <laughs> Yeah. It seems like you're doing, with each show, you do your version of the Goldberg variation. With each show? Yeah, it seems like each show has a, a variation on, like, searching, whatever. And it's like, uh, you're talking about the Berrigan poems, re, you know, redoing things. But it seems like each time you have something that triggers a whole series of associations, mm. but they're all connected, like the Goldberg variation. Mm. I don't know if that's true, but mm. that's what's true. Well, doing this, uh, this lecture, I, start, I did start feeling like I could just take pieces from anywhere. And I, I, it felt weird to even try to contextualize pieces of shows, uh, but it was also more an experiment maybe to see how they related, I guess. And, and it, there is, yeah, I, I haven't changed much maybe. That's <laughs> one, of, one of the lessons like I, and why I, I was talking too about like new life. It's like I'm hoping for new life and how, how, will, how will I change if I change or yeah. Yeah. Um, what kind of significance do you think you draw, or if any, from taking seemingly found or uh, unimportant objects and then giving them importance or finding a new home for them? Like, do you ponder that in your process of what, what that means or why? Yeah, I, I definitely. It, for me, I think it always starts with something personal that's happening to me in my life. I mean, I, I kind of am always looking and maybe collecting and, you know, arranging things. But for whatever reason, certain images rear up. And I think it's a two-way street. It's like I'm, something's happening to me that makes that suddenly important. And I also kind of feel like I'm almost like a a mother taking care of the neighborhood's, you know, weird trash or something. <laughs> I, uh, if you saw my room, you'd understand there's like lots of trash and stuff, uh, like kids' drawings and all kinds of things, and they immediately mean something to me, I mean to me, but uh, I, I, I don't know, I think, like I, I was doing these drawings of waterfalls for a long time and at the time it was my meditation on uh, uh, I was working as a caregiver with this guy who developed uh, cataracts in his eye and for anybody getting cataract surgery is kind of no big deal but for him it was very complex because cog cognitively he would, didn't really know that he couldn't rub his eyes so he was he had to be like strapped down. He had to wear these braces so he couldn't touch his eyes. So it was intense. It was an intense, like the, the recovery was like a year at least. And so that whole time I was drawing um, waterfalls, like cataracts, waterfalls. Uh, and it was my way of just meditating on how he would be seeing things. And, uh, and his mom too worked for the National uh, uh, Forest forestry or so I worked from a lot of her photographs and found photographs like but yeah very much so it, it's it, it's it's always personal and sometimes in retrospect I forget exactly why it was important like I don't remember why I did that but it was a long time ago too so um, where did you find to these paper pieces that you collected and to the records where do you find them? Uh, well, I mean, thrift stores, and there's a lot of stuff in, in San Francisco. I don't know, something about San Francisco, they just put things on the street. Um, there's also, uh, like, Amoeba Records in Berkeley. They put out these free records uh, every day. And I walk by there every day. So I just, <laughs> they're just there. I've made books out of them. I mean, it's like just great material and good music sometimes. <laughs> but uh, 
there's also there's these great stores one in there's one called uh, Center for Creative Reuse and Scraps, Scraps in San Francisco. Um, they're mostly for teachers who need supplies and can get them for really cheap uh, for their students because they hardly get paid anything, you know. So uh, I go there and you pay next to nothing. There, and there's a lot of free stuff there too. So I, yeah, I, it's usually discarded stuff that people aren't interested in, but for some reason, like, seeing a sun-cooked piece of paper or, like, you know, a record's been sitting on a record sleeve and you take the record off and there's this white moon shape. It's a drawing. It's it's done. It's, it was done by the sun. It's amazing. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that reminds me of seeing... Um, I was walking through the forest one day and I saw these circles on the ground, just light circles. And it was the sun, like, going through the leaves in the tree. I, and I always thought, well, that just happens when there's an eclipse. You know, you see the little eclipse and you... But it was happening, like... And then uh, my boyfriend said, yeah, light is all a picture of the sun. Like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the Reverend Oz, what is the youth? Yeah. So is that something you've been thinking about recently, or is that? Yeah. Do you? Um, I don't know. I'm seeing a correlation between the objects that you choose to use, and maybe that dealing with you said memory and forgetting or something. Mm -hmm. Kind of these, I don't know, forgotten materials maybe. Mm. Yeah, I haven't. I hadn't even really thought about it in relation to my art, I guess, but... No, it's, yeah, it's something for me to think about, I guess. <laughs> no, I like that. Yeah? I don't know how good of a question this is necessarily, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. And I read a quote um, from Brendan Boss on his audition to the Open Vegan Editions about how he didn't necessarily want to be remembered as a gay artist, like in art history, but he just wanted to be remembered as an artist. And I was just curious, like, what you thought of that, or hmm. like, as your art is gay art or regular art, or like, if they're even, like, connected, or if they're only connected. Hmm. You know? I think some of my art can be considered gay art, probably. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's all probably could also be looked at as all, like there's maybe a gay aesthetic that I don't know if there is or not. I I, I kind of don't mind either. I'm, I'm sure that there's something I'm not seeing in that politically, <laughs> but, but I think um, I would be, I think I'd be content. Well, I, yeah, maybe it depends, like who's saying who's gay. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's like, look at that gay artist. I mean, that would be weird. <laughs> or, if, yeah. or if, yeah. Or well, that regular artist. Look at well, that regular yeah, artist. artist is a little more heavy handed, but like a hockey or something. Mm. It's a little more, I don't know, it's just something I've been thinking about. Mm. No, it's a good, it's a good question. I, I don't, I don't know. I. I guess it's better to just be known as gay, maybe. <laughs> maybe I'm just a gay artist. <laughs> I'm not always happy, but I may I, I could probably say queer. I think I identify more queer queer. And then that's a whole question like what's queer and who's queer too? I, I mean, I don't have an answer, but I think there's plenty of people of all different sexual orientations that identify with queerness and I th think that's great yeah even if they're heterosexual queer maybe <laughs> but some people don't like like that idea hmm <laughs> No, 
Yeah, yeah, sorry. <coughs> I took too deep of a drink. Wow. Actually, I see the image in front of us right now is a very gay art to me. Mm. Because uh, you know, Sailor has a little iconic image of the like fantasy mm -hmm. A lot of gay people. Mm -hmm. So the minute when I saw that, you know, I got that kind of a call in San Francisco. It was just uh, the old sailors come to town. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Culture. You spoke about like, having trouble with your hands, and like, I was just curious, like, on a practical or whatever level, like, are they better now, or like, are you able, are you able to draw more? Or how you said it? How do um, you rethink your relationship with your body and how you worked? Um, just like, what are you thinking about that now? Is it affecting you now? Um, I'm. S they're still hurting. I mean, it's like a. Uh, the pain kind of changed. <coughs> sorry, <coughs> changes gradually, but uh, at night they hurt a lot. Um, and I don't know. I feel like I'm still kind of experimenting with with new things. I <coughs> I uh, I know that a lot of that work I don't think I would have made towards the end. It it, it seems different for me. Like the collages and um, the uh, the magnifying glass pieces. <coughs> Sorry, uh, but I, I I still I still don't know what's quite next. I, I think the walk to is kind of part of that change. Maybe maybe what will be emphasized are like the found objects themselves, or what what I don't know. Photographs too. I think I've I've been. You know, what are all the things I can still do? Um, and meanwhile, I've been just focusing on m healing, you know, like um, eating differently and doing Tai Chi and all these kinds of things. And it's totally a midlife crisis, <laughs> but it's great. <laughs> no, it kind of is. I don't know. I'm, I'm past the depressed part, if there was one, but um, it's... It, there is something kind of exciting. I don't know if art will be my day job anymore. Maybe it won't, but that that's okay too, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I've been lucky that I can make art and and uh, get by, but there has been I've been slowing down, and I'm not sure if it uh, if I'll be able to continue or not. We'll see. Can you talk about your San Diego project and how? Your hands have led to that. Uh, how how the hand, oh yeah how that relates to your hands. Well, I I guess just because I can still walk, <laughs> that's how it relates. Um, and it I I guess in another way it it sort of relates in that um. Well, I'm doing this one piece. It's it's uh, I'm documenting with photographs this uh, street where there's been this incredible street repair. You know, they lay tar and they fill the cracks. And uh, for whatever reason, on this one block in Berkeley, Oregon Street, half the block is crazy. They went crazy, and they just did this beautiful. It looks like a Japanese like scroll, sumi ink painting. And so I did a walk where I walked one picture per step and documented the whole thing. And it, in my mind, I was like, this will be 50 pictures and ended up being a thousand and uh, or over a thousand. And I, um, so a friend was asking me how it was going, putting them back together uh, as a pu puzzle. And she said, she called it a street repair. And I thought, street repair, that's a good name for it. And um, and I looked up the word repair because I love words so much. <laughs> and it, the origin of it means um, a returning home or home, return to your native country. And I thought, well, that's, that's exactly what I'm doing with this, um, this, this piece, walking back home. It's a repair. And so in that sense, it's, I, 
that's the mode I'm in is repair. And so maybe the walk is kind of this meditation on repairing kind of too. But, um, but it's also thinking about, I, I mean, even mentioning El Camino Real, that's such a loaded kind of term. And I, I was thinking like, should I even kind of walk that because it's so loaded and there's so much devastation that was done on that on that road with Native Americans and stuff like that and so and just um, colonialism so I I was kind of thinking like it's also going to be a meditation about that that violence and the hurt involved and um, maybe that's related to my hands too I, I don't know somehow in some weird way So, uh, we'll curious, without directing this question too much towards specifics or specific pieces, um, I'm curious in terms of your interpretation or reinterpretation of these memory drawings or reinterpretation of materials like the record jacket or postcards, like how many cycles of the, what reinterpretation or iterations these go through until you consider something final? Um. Well, I think these two, there's only a few that I, I did that were more than, more than two. And, uh, for, for like for this one, I, I did a memory drawing of a moon. And that, that whole show to me was about moon cycles. And, uh, so I wanted a month, one month. I wanted to represent one month and to see how it would change. So, you know, there was a reason in, the, in like in that show, and this was another piece in that show, also referencing the moon, the moon, the phases of the moon, and also like revolution, the idea of bodies spinning around other bodies. Um, um, but generally it was, the origin of the memory drawing started from two, because it, the first one was, the idea came from memory games, that game you played where you pair things and uh, I made eight eight of them so there were 16 pieces and it was kind of a failed piece like it didn't work very well as a game but the drawings were the kind of uh, happy accident and I was like well I, oh this is interesting actually the drawings were and that became more the process not the game um, and so I would just sort of change you know the change it up, I don't know, somehow. I think there's just a few more at the end here somewhere. I have no, I, I had no idea of how, like what length, <laughs> length is in a lecture, so. <laughs> but, anyway, there's some, somewhere, there like that. Okay, yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.